Hi, and welcome to A World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics, and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahl Bait. Tonight, for our second episode, we're joined by the wonderful Bishop Mark Strange, the Primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church. We discuss his role as Primus, the political and civil society responsibilities of religious leaders, what it means to engage substantively in interfaith dialogue and celebration, and finally, Trump and evangelicals in America. It's wonderful to be here with the Primus and Syed Razavi. As a first question, Primus, I wanted to ask you what it actually entails and what it means to be a Primus of the Episcopal Church because I think it's quite an esoteric term for our viewers, and if you could shed some light on what that role specifically entails. The history of being the, the primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church, and, and, I, and I am the only primus in, in, in religious terms, um, except in some ways the Archbishop of Canterbury would be perceived as primus of the Anglican Communion. Um, the, the primus basically is the person who chairs the meetings of the College of Bishops, um, because in Scotland, as one of the few parts of the Anglican Communion that doesn't have an archbishop. Uh, we don't have an archbishop because the last time we asked for an archbishop, um, the king we asked was, was on, on the wrong side. It was the Stuart monarchs. We supported the Stuarts. And the king ref- didn't give us an archbishop. And so ultimately, the bishops decided they needed to elect somebody to keep themselves in order. And uh, that person should be Primus Inter Paris. So I'm first among equals. Um, I'm given the title Most Reverend. That's um, uh, an honorific which is there. So I stand equally amongst the archbishops of the communion. And so my my, my, my role is to um, internally is to chair the business. Externally is to behave like an archbishop. If I behave like an archbishop internally, the rest of the bishops very quickly remind me that I am not an archbishop. And if I behave like a primus in the primates meeting of the Anglican Communion, I'm reminded that they need me to make a decision not continually going back to the others to ask. So I live down that interesting middle line. It's a wonderful job. I'm elected by my peers and I'm elected for the duration of my ministry. Excellent. So now we have more lucidity on what your role is. I wanted to ask both you, Primus, and Syed, given the recent end of Ramadan, Eid al-Fitr, what does it mean to share in interfaith celebrations or as a Christian to share in a Muslim celebration, as a Muslim to share in a Christian celebration without losing elements of your identity, but also recognizing just how fervently important these events are in the lives of our religious compatriots. So how do you see that being navigated? How yourself have you brokered those interfaith relationships? And particularly in the context recently of Ramadan, what does that look like for you? Well, shall I go? I mean, I, I, I live in a part of the world where we are trying as, a, as, as, a, as an institution, as a nation, so hard to make everyone feel as welcome as possible that it's it's almost, it's all, it's all, it is almost impossible to become um, separatist. It's almost impossible to believe that, that, that you are right and someone else isn't. Because if you believe that and you're prepared to, um, to push that to its ultimate limit, then of course you will have a division in society. I, I know what I believe. I, I live by what I believe. And what I believe is that, 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 Jesus Christ came to teach us how to love one another and to to love God. And and on that basis, if I can get that through to people, then the the way that they reflect on that and the culture they come from and the um, inevitability that wherever you come from, then that's how you grow. I I know I wouldn't be a Scottish Episcopalian if I'd been born in Baghdad, Mm. but I would still, I hope, be a holy person. Mm. So the living in a community where it's, it's becoming quite normal to understand that when you're at school 
uh, when you're when you're out in the community you are going to be mixing then you can do that of one or two ways you can either do it begrudgingly and that's where you get the vision or you can accept it now i'm a gregarious soul who likes a good party so when my muslim brothers invite me to a meal to in to celebrate the end of ramadan you would you would be hard pressed to make to, to assume that i wouldn't turn up if, if someone's going to give me a good meal a good conversation the opportunity to enjoy myself then i will always say yes and to know i'm doing that that by engaging in that with with another faith that they understand that i honor them and that they honor me by 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 the invitation the conversations we might have are important the theological implications might be important but ultimately it's to, to do with loving each other and mm. you can only do that if you are actually in a relationship mm. and it seems that a large part of that then is first having such a firm belief and firm conviction understanding of what you yourself stand for from which point it can be much easier to mediate these sorts of relationships because it doesn't feel like you're making a compromise. It feels like you're wholeheartedly embracing another culture without any endogenous effects to your beliefs because you do have those convictions. And so yeah. if you could reflect yourself on, on what those interfaith dynamics look like from the end of you potentially being the one who extends the offer, what it looks like to solicit the contributions of people across faiths and what it looks like to involve them in traditions which are so deeply, personally, intimately held within a religious community. Look, I think Scotland's very much unique in the way that it's come together over the last couple of years, especially on the interfaith front. And I would say that it's primarily because of friendships. And I think that's something that's really changed the dynamics of how things are working. You know, having extensively traveled over the last eight years, I've seen across the world interfaith being something as a, an official checklist. Uh, but I think within Scotland, it's not the case. And the reason why I would say that is because there are genuine friendships. And some of these friendships mimic, let's say, the Middle East of 200 years ago or 150 years ago. And as the example was, mention of Baghdad or let's say Aleppo or Damascus, the way you'd find Christians, Jews and Muslims coming together and celebrating and then at the same time mourning together, being there for one another. I think it enhances one's faith. I don't think it diminishes one's faith. I think the idea of acceptance is very important in all of our traditions. And as the Prime Minister rightly said, this is something that's felt in all of the Abrahamic faiths, the idea of love and compassion. Now, I would look at the teachings of Jesus as the word of God, because for us, Jesus was a messenger of God. And so therefore what he says is the word of God. And there are two, I think, aspects of faith, which are very important for us. One is our duty to humanity and one is our duty to God. Now our duty to humanity must start off with love and compassion because otherwise what it becomes is textual and legalistic. And I think the vast majority of people look through the lens of compassion and love. That's what appeals to them. Not every single person that we come across is a theologian or, or otherwise. So I think it's important to look at that from the, from the prism of love and compassion. And this is why I think it works in Scotland. Because we're friends. Because it's not the fact that oh, so-and-so happens to be a Christian or so-and-so is a Jew or so-and-so is an atheist. I think above and beyond that, so-and-so is Mark, and so-and-so is Michelle, and so-and-so happens to be Muhammad or Azhar or Shabir. And I think it's those personal relationships which are important. Now, for every time that we've invited guests, and we try and do that at least once or twice a year, we've had an amazing response. It's been like a family. And... The Prime Minister's come and he's, you know, shared with us food and his wisdom, but more so his love and his friendship. And that's what really appeals to all of my congregation. 
And I feel the reason why each one of my congregation are so close to the Episcopal Church is because of that friendship. They don't know the theology behind it. If you were to ask them, what is the theological difference between this denomination and that denomination, they have no clue. But the one thing that they do know is when we do go to church or when we do meet a member of the Primus's congregation, they, tr they treat them with love and compassion. And you know, it was only last year around about this time where three of us actually were together from my congregation and we went over to the Synod. And this was an experience for all of us. And the, the love and the compassion that was shown is such that even to this day, you know, members of my congregation who are there, they still talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what it is to extend, um, I would say your table or to bridge gaps. And I believe today if Jesus or the prophet Muhammad was to come, I think they'd be very happy that we're talking, that we're friends, that we stick up for one another, that we help one another, and, and at the same time that we are accepting of one another's diversity. Because if we are the children of God, and we have been made in the image of God, the image of God is multiple, has multiple different shades. And we may hold a different belief, theological belief that is, but I feel we share one humanity. And I guess in this month of Ramadan, which has gone, it was very challenging. You know, you can imagine you're in lockdown. And at least in Scotland, I know that my congregation was separated from their families. You know, my sister has given birth recently and I've not been able to see the child. And she's my younger sister. And, you know, we were all looking forward to it. But the problem is just that. We're in lockdown, we're respecting the lockdown. And families have been divided because of it. We've not been able to communicate in the way that we would have done. But our faith teaches us that we must respect the laws of the land. That's the problem with sometimes having your laptop connected <laughs> to the iPad is that someone calls. <laughs> you know, you could have a During evening prayer the other day from my chapel here, which is being live streamed, someone rang my phone, which I was using to film and I hadn't turned it down. So yes, I understand. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on this exogenous note of what it is to reconcile between faiths and to embrace other faiths to what coronavirus has meant for internal questions of faith, both to the primus and Sayed within your own congregations. And what I mean by this is I think there's a tendency for the prevailing discourse around religion during times of such crises to revolve around questions of how could God do this? Or how could this be the case that the God you believe in, and often it's imputations against religious believers, that the God you believe in would submit you to this sort of fate or to this sort of turmoil in, in times of acute crisis? This seems to be the prevailing discourse. So I guess my question is twofold. The first one being, have you seen within your own congregations different manifestations of crises of faith or difficulties in reconciling the events that they see around them with their understanding of God and their religion? And then secondly, yourselves, in navigating those external skeptical pressures, what it looks like either to push back or yourselves maintain a narrative which is cohesive, is coherent, and inspires faith in a time which requires that sort of strength of faith, in which that faith is such a salvation. I think you've got to start at the point of, of, of figuring out what it is you as um, people of faith ha have communicated to the world, communicated to the, to the people you are, you are serving. Uh, and, and that's the operative word. Uh, I mean, the, the, the closure of our churches we were immediately attacked for being fearful. Uh, and one of my colleagues said, no, we're, we're closing our churches out of love, not out of fear. And if you, if you have communicated that the God you, you, hold, you hold to, the God you believe in, is a God who somehow takes away all your responsibility, takes away all the, the need for you to, 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 to use your own skills and gifts, 
then you can move that towards a God who steps in and steps out, steps in and steps out. And why has God done this to us? Most in the Scottish Episcopal Church don't see God in that sense. God is the action of God in the world through Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is something that dwells within us, that dwells in, in, in our sacramental life. It is not something which denudes you of your humanity. It actually enhances your humanity. So very few, no, I, I can think of nobody in the last nine weeks who has said to me from within my own congregations, why is God doing this to us? Because they understand that this is something that's wherever it's come from, it's come within, you know, something that has happened in the world, a virus, viruses appear and viruses go away. That doesn't change the fact that God loves us. It doesn't change the fact that we have a, a, an understanding of, of eternal life in the company of God. And, and so many, many people actually return to faith during those crises in their life. Because it's then that they actually discover what to be truly loved means. So in many ways, what's happened is that people have returned to the congregations. People have reconnected through digital communications or, or, or through the live streaming. People have put aside the anger they had with me. You know, I, I might have managed to create a few more in the last few days. But, but people have reconnecting because it's not to do with saying, God has done this to you, it is saying that God stands with you as you work through this situation. Abandonment by God, if that's how people feel, doesn't normally come at moments like this because people gather. The hardest thing we've had is because this is the one occasion where we've actually had to shut down all the institution in the way that people expect it to operate. But in fact, the church is as live, alive and busy and active and doing all the things it should be doing. And I have never been this busy um, at the moment. And those who say to me on, on my Facebook page or on Twitter, etc., your God has abandoned you, then I would just simply say, I, I know from the moment I get up and say the morning office that I'm not abandoned by God. In fact, if anything, I feel the presence of God stronger now to get me through each of these moments than I do on a normal glorious sunny day when I'm trying to go and find my way into the garden. So we haven't experienced that. There's been very little experience of, of people being anxious and actually very little experience of external pressure saying, where is God? Because I think when people are as scared as they are at the moment, whatever they may say about their economic concerns, etc., when they're as scared as they are at the moment about something they cannot control, then actually that's when you find people suddenly turning to themselves and saying, well, I can't get the answers there. I might just pray. Hmm. Hmm. Sad, do you have any reflections or on a similar or potentially different note from your own experiences within your congregation? I think that's a very important point that the Prime Minister has just mentioned. Um, I think we, we're finding our congregations, at least online, increasing. So whereas before we were very social in the fact that we would physically go to mosques, ever since the close down, and again, I don't think I've had any question from anyone so far in terms of a moment of crisis in, the, in their faith. I think it's accepted that this world is a world of cause and effect. It's accepted that certain things happen. And in fact, in the month of Ramadan, I think people have actually benefited from being isolated in this way because they've managed to focus more on the spirituality. And I could truly say for myself that it's been one of the most spiritual months for me because I've managed to focus on prayer and I guess many a time it just comes down to being able to focus, focus on God. In the life that we live in, we're scattered for many a time. We're running from one meeting to another. We're focused on one thing and then another thing. We don't get much time to actually focus on God. At least I don't. 
but this month provided me with the opportunity to focus, to contemplate, to meditate, to centralize my thoughts on one thing, and that was worship. So in terms of busyness, I completely agree. I've never been so busy in my life from the morning to the evening. And I've learned a new concept as well, known as Zoom fatigue. Mm-hmm. So it, it is something that really, you know, by the evening, you just don't want to look at a screen. No. Uh, and it, be, it becomes so tiring sometimes. But the beauty of it is, is that I guess, you know, when we were thinking that this mode of worship or coming together that we've had for thousand, well, at least a thousand years, what's the next mode? And we've realized actually God doesn't just reside in a location. But God's everywhere. And our online congregations, and I, I think it's the same for all religions to, at this moment, that online congregations are increasing. You've given people the choice. And I think people are coming more to, more to God, to praying. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're more religious, whatever religi- religiosity is. But I think the most important thing is that people are praying there. They're hoping. And, and I guess there's a hidden wisdom behind this. And I find... Anything that's to do with, I, I guess, natural, call it disasters or, you know, the way that the climate works. You know, you've noticed what, 17%, we were looking at what, a 7% target to increase the ozone and the atmosphere. And we've just gone up by 17%. You know, you could see badgers coming out. We've never seen that before. You've seen all sorts of animals coming onto the roads. You know, animals are feeling safe now. But before they weren't, our climate has improved, our air has improved, the oxygen has improved. And so I guess it's, it's cause and effect of the world that we live in. Can we blame God? <laughs> well, no, we can't. Because this is the way that God has created the world. And sometimes, as, as one of my friends who is into ecology was saying, this is the world reacting back. And if we were to take all the precautions that have been told to us to take, and if we had to truly lock down as opposed to driving two or 300 miles, I think that we'd stand a better chance of improving very fast. And if everybody did observe, you know, you look at New Zealand today, New Zealand are, you know, up and running. And why are they up and running? Because they truly observe the laws and, you know, the, uh, the, the asks from the government. And so they're up and running. And I believe that if we were all to do that, if we were all to be responsible human, human beings and citizens, and I know it's difficult, you know, I'm not going to preach that. It's very difficult, but okay. If we were to, follow that and all of us were to be responsible it's not god's fault sometimes it's our fault as well we've got to take responsibility you know we've been given free will and we've been given the ability to make choices and if we make the wrong choice things are going to spread but if we don't we can contain this and there are very good examples of communities across the world who have contained this virus and who are over i think the worst of it and they're going they're improving they're going to its betterment because they were responsible and they were observed so you know so i think it comes down to the fact that we can't blame god for everything he's given us all of the tools i think to use to get over any hurdle that comes in our life and 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 i think finally what i'd say is that i felt that i think our communities have grown there's anxiety there Part of that anxiety, I guess, at least for Muslims, is Islamophobia. I think what's kept Muslims in-house more than just the regulation has been that tomorrow people are going to attack us to say that, look, it's the Muslims who are spreading this. And unfortunately, if you go back a month, people were saying that. Though every Muslim I spoke to was actually self-isolating, probably not because of the fact that they had to, but more so because of the fact that they were afraid of the Islamophobic attacks on them or the anti-Muslim hatred. So, you know, so I think it's, it's unfortunate, but at least our community was motivated to stay indoors. And when Eid came, as it did, you know, again, we weren't in the situation where we could go and visit one another, but at least in Scotland, everybody stayed at home. And I guess they were happy for it. So, you know, we're working together. Sorry. Can I just reflect that, 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 that on, on what Saeed has said about on, on, on having all that, that opportunity to, to, to pray? For me, you asked the question of, of, of you know, interfaith matters. For the first time in Ramadan, um, I had time to reflect 
as the sun went down in the highlands that my that my friends were were now going to be able to have something to eat you know and have something to drink um and i i might have thought about that normally maybe once or twice on the train heading back up the line because i could see the sun going down but i you know here in the highlands of scotland it doesn't go down very much at the moment um but but i was aware daily of the moment when things were relaxing for those people who i consider to be my friends and so it was it, it was a far more it, it gave me something to focus on um Whereas normally it's, well, we'll pray for our, 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 our Muslim brothers and sisters as they go into Ramadan and we do that and then we pray and they come out. But actually, we felt far more part of it. Um, I, I, I don't, let's, let's not get too extreme. I, I, I wasn't fasting during the day. That's not, you know, but we were aware of what was going, going on in, in, a, in a, I think in a far more connected way than I've ever experienced because we were all in the same place. You know, it in our own homes, uh, and that that was quite powerful. Yeah. So the two really salient points there: this consciousness, this capacity to be aware, in ways that we're potentially not able to be when there is an overwhelming number of stimuli, and also to that point that you made, Syed, about faith not being one theologically, which is divinely coerced, but one which is of the will, and which is of your freedom. And therefore, that being something which is an internal force rather than something that is, is foisted upon you. The, the fact that we do have the capacity to make choices from a theological view of religion. I wanted to move to questions of responsibility as religious leaders. Specifically, Primus, I know that you very recently published an open letter to Boris Johnson in Parliament denouncing the advisor to the government. Uh, I've for some reason omitted the first name, but Cummings, who had violated lockdown restrictions. And I think that more than in other forms of communities, in religious communities, there's always a vexed question of in which cases do you intervene in the public sphere? In which cases do you promote a certain viewpoint in ways which can ostensibly seem political, which can ostensibly exceed the parameters which are imposed by secular governance on our understanding of religious institutions and the role of religious leaders. So I wanted both an understanding from the two of you actually of where you see that responsibility being born out of to step out of just your congregation and to intervene in the public space. And secondly, what sort of constraints or why you made those, that type of decision, what your motivation was in this circumstance specifically. Okay. Can, can I just, just say that, that actually I, I, my letter wasn't a condemnation of um, Dominic Cummings. My, 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 my letter was a criticism of the UK government who, um, having heard um, what he had done, then did not, did not act in a way I think they should have done, um, mm -hmm. which, as it happened in other cases, would have been to ask the person to step down. Um, mm -hmm. I, I recognise, I mean, I have a daughter who is in Edinburgh. Um, I have not seen her for, for, for nine weeks. Um, she's living in a flat uh, and um, I am desperate to go and see her. My, my wife's mother is in a care home in, in, in Lancashire, England, and you can imagine why we would be desperate to see her. So there is, the, the, the letter was actually saying my disappointment was in the, the government's response um, because in fact they they should have taken hold of that. I recognize all of us have the capacity to, to do something in the, in the heat of a moment, which we, we shouldn't do. Um, and, and so, but why did I reach that point? Well, one, because the behavior, um, and, and every time I, I, I make such a response into, into the public sphere, it's when I see that decisions of, of government or decisions of institutions or um, or whatever it's coming from, are actually putting people's lives at risk or are damaging the, the life of other people. So you can make generic statements about the you know, homelessness within Scotland, you can make, and you know that while that is happening, the government are as concerned, the government are working on that, the government are trying to sort that out as well. So you work alongside the, 
the political institutions, you work alongside the, the, the national institutions. But periodically, something happens, a law is changed or, or, or an occasion takes place which will bring damage, you, I believe will bring damage to people. And so I, my belief is that if you encourage other people to break the lockdown laws, more people will die. Um, simple as that. Um, the last time I think I made such a strong statement was, was to do with the, the plight of the refugees. And if you have a government that changes the laws about who is welcome and not welcome into your country, then people are going to suffer and die. So it's that moment when it's no longer possible for me, following my religious principles and also my human principles, which are no longer for me to be able to say what this needs is a, a meeting where we can all sit down and have a conversation about the best way forward. And comes the point where actually, if you don't say something, you are colluding with a, with a, a situation which I, I think is immoral or I think is damaging to the institution or the, or the, or the nation and, and occasionally because it's damaging to the, to the faith that I, I'm a leader of. Um, so all of those reasons, but it's that moment when you sit there and I, and I sat, I've got a chapel above this room. I sat up there on, 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 on Sunday uh, after having heard the, 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 the speeches. I sat up there for hours wondering what I needed to do. Was there any other thing I could do which would have any impact? And I, I'm not foolish enough to think that this might have impact, but there was there any other mechanism I could, and I'd run to the end of that. So that's the moment. And I have to say, I didn't sleep Sunday night and I didn't sleep, yes, last night, because it's not something I enjoy doing. Um, and hopefully I never enjoy doing it because you are causing other people and some people very close to me hurt. Disillusioned by their religious leader making a statement they don't agree with. Mm. But it's, it's that moment. It's that moment where, where I, and, and what, I mean, this sounds really trite. What was I doing upstairs? I was saying, how would Jesus respond? Mm. You know, that's, you know, no, I, don't, I never have the answer to that, because if, if I knew that, then that's putting myself in a very dangerous position. But, you know, just what would be, and, and, and by the morning, that was a letter in the post. Yeah. So, and, and, and I also have to recognize two things, which I find very self-effacing, very difficult to deal with is one that my colleagues and my church elected me into the position I'm in, not so that I would shrink away quietly in a corner. Um, and the other is, why am I a bishop in the church? Because I believe I'm called by God. And if I'm feeling in my heart that I need to do something, then, then I get that nudge. So that's where I, that's where I sit. And potentially I could reframe the question more generally for you, Syed, which is, as a religious leader, sometimes I'm sure you have impulses to serve, well, in fact, always have impulses to serve communities beyond your immediate congregation. And part of that means paying regard to the effects of policies or paying regard to the effects of different social norms, stigma, whatever it may be, beyond the bounds of your religious congregation. So I was wondering from your perspective, how is it that you navigate a similar dialectic, which the Primus discussed, of knowing when it is the time to step out into the public sphere, which is less cloistered to just your religious community, which has effects which are far reaching and potentially internalized by both your religious community and without, as is the case of this sort of violation or the lack of the UK government's condemnation of Dominic Cummings' behavior. Look, firstly, if I can congratulate the Primus for the decision he made, because it's a very important one. It's a moment in history, I think, and the fact that he was able to articulate and explain it is very important. So whatever decision a leader makes, 
it's very brave of him or her to do so, especially when you know that there will be ramifications to that, which really tells me that a person's inner conscious is still alive, that we are accountable to God as well as our peers. But in a position where you're a religious leader, it's very important for at least you to justify to yourself that you are fulfilling what you feel that God or Jesus or Muhammad or Moses would have done. Now we can't speak for them. And if we make that claim, it becomes very dangerous as the primer said. However, it is important in times like this. If, if a leader is a good leader, they will end up making decisions which are quite difficult. And, you know, just to add to some of that, you see, my issue in and of itself was the lack of humility by the government in dealing with this. And they said, look, you know, it's a mistake. Mistakes happen, fine. It's a serious mistake, but mistakes happen, okay. I'm not here to make a moral judgment on an individual. But for a government to lack humility, almost as so what? That for me is problematic. So the question is this, why didn't I write something? And the reason being is this, that I felt that it would have had no impact because of the stereotype that comes with a Muslim leader writing something. That's why for me, it's easier to support others than to write something which people would have said, okay, we, we would have expected this from the Muslims anyway, because they feel that so-and-so party may be Islamophobic or so-and-so. It could have been spun in any direction. And so because of that, I thought, okay, if I was to write something, it would have had no impact whatsoever. In fact, it could have had a detrimental impact. So here we are Muslims whining again. Um, but, what we can do and what we should do is to support those individuals whose words may have an impact. And coming from the Christian faith, it would have an impact. And I do know that a number of the advisors, key advisors, are actually Christian, are actually, uh, you know, practicing Christians. So it does have an impact. And, you know, coming to your question, if we're doing our job correct, we'll be put into situations which are highly charged, which will be pressured. And in those situations, we've been put there to make decisions. Sometimes people may not like that. The certain decisions that I've made, even over the last couple of months, which individuals don't like. For my own congregation, that is. They will say, how can you do this? What's the justification for that? And sometimes you can explain, but other times you shouldn't be frightened of making a decision because from the perspective that you're looking for, it's like you're coming from a bird's eye view. Our situation is such that we see things differently from the average, let's say Muslim. And the reason being is that you're looking at things from an overall overarching perspective sometimes. And if let's say, there is a decision that's made. For example, let's say to close down the mosques. It's because we're looking at things from a perspective which is not just an isolated perspective based on, let's say, Dalkeith, just on the border of Edinburgh, but you're looking at it from a Scottish perspective, and then perhaps a UK perspective, and then perhaps a European perspective. So we're in a position whereby it's not, the lens isn't just one lens. It's a multi-dimensional prism. And this is why sometimes you find that you will get opposition from people and I don't blame them either. They're right in their perspective because they're looking at it from one particular lens and they can swear to God that their position is objective and it has no malice and they truly believe in it. And I say, thank you. And I credit the integrity and I credit the sincerity. However, from the, my own perspective, in the responsibility that I have, in the position that I've been bestowed upon, 
I've got to make a decision which is for everyone and not just for one person. And so sometimes it has happened that we've made a decision. We've met a particular individual that other people may not have wanted us to meet. We may have jumped into a particular project that somebody may not have wanted us to jump into. But we thought it was for the betterment of not just our faith, but of society. And I think and I believe every religious leader is not just a leader of their faith. They're a guardian of their society. And that includes multiple faiths, people of faith and no faith. Because even to this day, faith still is a moral compass that people look towards. Be they people of faith or no faith. A person of no faith will still look at you, myself, let's say, and say, look, but you're a religious leader. You're meant to make the moral choice, a moral decision. So what I do find is that we are guardians in our own right of the, fa- the moral fabrics of our society. And so therefore, I can completely sympathize with the primus and the decision he made because that's what his calling was. And if God calls you to make a decision, I wouldn't say directly, but you know, could <laughs> says do this but no if you feel in your heart if you've contemplated if you've sat there you prayed you've prayed on it you've used your wisdom on this then that is the decision that one needs to make and we must respect that decision because it's coming from a, a place of contemplation a place an informed place and as you know religious leaders just don't wake up in the morning and say right that's it Mm-hmm. Gabriel came last night and this is what I should be doing. That's not the case. The decision is an informed decision. And, and because of that, I think we must be supportive. And even those people who disagree, they should remain within the parameters of morality, ethics, manners. And they should, and they should make the protest in a way which is I would say divorced of emotion in many ways because they have to, you've got to empathize that this is not an easy position. You know, my hair hasn't gone white sitting under the sun. <laughs> much, much of it has happened because of the fact that you worry about your community and difficult decisions are there and you make those decisions and you'll lose sleep and you'll lose weight and you know, all sorts of other pressures will be on you. And sometimes you can't sleep. You know, I'll be honest, I didn't sleep properly last night. And the reason being is that some of the decisions that we have to make, but we're also human. And I think people need to appreciate that. We're not infallible. We're human and we have to make a decision to the best of our ability. And I truly believe that if we're sincere, which we are to our cause, to our people, to the wider community, God will help us because God is there to help us. He knows that our decision is sincere. And he knows what we've done, what we've made, the statements that we give are because of sincerity and through sincerity. And I truly believe that God is our helper. And if anybody puts their faith in God, in Jesus, or for us in Muhammad, then I do believe that they will protect us, they will help us, and however difficult the waves are, we will be able to ride those waves. On the note of good faith leadership, of assuming responsibility, of sincerity, I wanted to talk about the discourse that prevails in America at the moment, where Trump has scurried to open up places of worship, And I think foisted religious leaders into many dilemmas on different levels. And so, again, my question operates on two levels. The first one being some form of reflection from both of you on how it is that different congregations can hold such vastly different perceptions on opening up places of worship, which seem to follow not necessarily a religious logic, but an exogenous political logic or some form of charismatic logic and how you've seen that play out in your own communities versus how you've seen it play out abroad or in potentially more polemical, more demagogic settings. And the second question being one of, as an individual, as a religious leader, placed in that 
really difficult nexus where you have to decide to contravene what is a very public pressure to open up your your churches, your mosques, your places of worship in general, how you navigate that decision given how overwhelming that pressure is, and also with the sense that, for example, as you mentioned, Said Razavi, being a leader and a religious leader is not just a question of making decisions purely from one dimension. It's about considering the stigma around certain types of decisions or how different communities are asymmetrically affected by different narratives. So broadly, a reflection on what's happening in America, a reflection on how that contrasts and compares with your own congregations and your own valences towards this form of religious leadership. Hmm. You'll have to bear with me as I stumble slightly through. Um, I mean, I, I, I have visited the United States. I have um, uh, an honorary doctorate from Swanee and I have been to the General Convention of the Episcopal Church. And um, my perception always is that what you, what you have very often in um, a country which, where people are still very religious, uh, and I use the term religious, that you know, the church going seems to be still quite an important element of people's um, political life as much as any other life. And, 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 we, and I watch with interest as um, those who are seeking election court the, the religious dimension and the religious leaders, and, and, and you, you, you make a choice. I mean, we, we have a long list of, you know, on the back of books of, of those potential presidents of the United States who are members of the Episcopal Church, you know, just to, you know, to, to have some understanding of how they might re relate to people. And we are in a situation now where very clearly a particular type of religious experience, which is framed in a particular type of Christian experience has been an, an upholder and a mainstay and a bulwark for the president, president. And to have the people gathered in a situation where they can give that support, where they can shout that support, where they can be filmed giving that support, then that's really important for a beleaguered prime, uh, beleaguered prime, <laughs> beleaguered uh, president. But when they are not prepared to open, then in fact your your much of your power base is dissipated out. You don't you, you don't have them there, and much of that style of 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 being in the presence of God is to do with the huge gathering. Is to do with the the way that it affects people. Um, by being affected by their their neighbor's experience of God, then I can understand why the president why the president might want the churches open, but what failing to recognise is that that in fact all indications are that churches are probably one of the worst places for the spreading of the virus, simply because people do sing, they shout, they hug, they do all the things which you're not supposed to be doing. So I'm bemused. Um, clearly, he hasn't got the authority to actually make the churches open, and I, and I suspect they will go down the lines. There will be churches who will open because their president said so, and there'll be churches that won't, won't open because their president said so. And that's the political divide you seem to have in the United States, and we're heading towards a presidential election. <coughs> I, I don't envy anyone who's trying to work their way through that, and I am very conscious of you know, um, the presiding bishop of the, of, of the Episcopal Church and, and other bishops who are friends of the, the task that they're, they've got in front of them. For me, the real complication of this now is that I know that people, however many Zoom services you put on, however many um, wonderful acts of worship in empty churches led by, by wonderful priests, excellent sermons, all that, however much you do that, people need to be together. That's how we interact with God. It's in that fellowship. And, and, and for us, it's that, that physical reception of the body and blood of Christ. You know, saying to people, you, you, you can't receive that which you always have to give you the strength to get through the next week. You know, that that physicalness. 
And I know that the difficulties I'm going to face are that some of our larger and younger congregations will have all the, the gifts and skills necessary to open. They'll be able to socially distance. They will understand all that. They will have enough volunteers. But in my own diocese, I have congregations which are small, which are in churches which have no water supply, never have had, which uh, if anyone is under the age of 70, that is seen as having a Sunday school. Um, that, that, that they're not going to be able to open. And it's somehow finding the mechanism which allows the people in, for example, St. Michael's Dufton, our tiny congregation, to feel that they're still part of the church when, you know, 40, 50 miles down the road, there's a congregation who are meeting and, and, and able to do all the things that they want to be able to do be, be because they're a different type of structure. And, and somehow finding a way through that to enable the, 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 the family which makes up a diocese, in my case, um, and, and a province, that, that we don't allow this moment, which could be so powerful with all the new people who've made contact, with all the new experiences we've had, the new ways of to, to suddenly find ourselves dividing because some can and some can't. And, and so, yeah, that, that sense of much of my work, I believe, will be in conversation with people in, in the small congregations saying, you know, we're not abandoning you. You will get there. You will catch up. You will be with us. And saying to some of the large congregations that can do everything, look, just go a bit slower. You know, remember what it's like to live 40 miles up the road there in the hills. And that's where the real skills, I think, the real gifts, the real teaching for, of, of Jesus comes in. You know, that sense of being able to communicate to the, the, the crowd, but knowing that when you communicate to the crowd, you're speaking to each individual and sustaining that, that connection. And if we're not able to do that, then I ha that's where I have fears. Not fears for the church. The church is, is far bigger than this virus. The church is certainly far bigger than anything I can or can't make it or ask it to do. But um, we, we certainly will not be helped if a government turns around and makes decisions about what churches should or mosques should do without actually sitting down with us and saying, what would be the best way to do this? And thankfully, thankfully in Scotland, um, that conversation takes place all the time. The Scottish government has people who want to talk to us, want to, to, to say what will help, what won't help. Um, and they won't use this as a political tool. They will use this as, they, they will find the best way to enable places of worship to open in a way which is safe and secure. My promise to the people of the Episcopal Church in Scotland, even though some of them don't like it, is that I won't rush forward ever on this. Each place will open when it is happy and content that it is able to do so. There'll be no pressure from me or any of the other bishops. And those who want me to be a have-a-go hero and get everything up and running, well, they're realizing that's not likely to happen either. We, I, I think we have an example to show the world that we really can't be um, involved in, in, in any of this. This sense of making it have to happen now because somehow um, the only way that it looks like we're being successful with this virus is to say we stamp on you rather than saying let's just find a way of moving it out of here. I, that's not a particularly good analogy, but it's that sense of, we talked about it earlier on. Um, for, for me, this isn't an economic thing. I understand the economic issues. Um, I've got some very big buildings to look after. But you, we close the churches out of love and we must only reopen them when we're convinced 
but by doing that, we don't damage the people we love. Yes. And this, I th it's a very complex discussion and it's a very testing discussion. I can give you a parallel, at least in the United Kingdom, so you can maybe draw something to what's taking place in the United States. And again, the United States is a completely different, I guess, terrain where you'll find that our opposites over there may have a completely different opinion and that's fine um, because every community is within the mechanisms of their own atmosphere, of their own politics, of their own communal politics. So I remember a couple of weeks ago when a date was given, 4th of July, I believe, for when the UK government wanted to reassess when to open or if they should be opening places of worship. And at the time, you know, I got a call from a particular faith leader. And, and he said to me, look, you know, is it possible that you could support us open places of worship? And we had a discussion on that. Uh, and I said, look, you know, let's go step by step, stage by stage on this. Um, and I said, look, you know, the mode of Muslim prayer is such that we have to stand shoulder to shoulder. If somebody sneezes, regardless of whether you're two meters away or not, let's say you're, on the, you're, you're sitting on a balcony and you sneeze, the entire congregation can be affected. So I said, look, because our prayer mode is different, there is no way we can separate two meters or five meters. By its very nature, the way that we come congregate is shoulder to shoulder prayers. So question was asked and he put a quite a decent statement forward. He said, well, what about if we have a two tier system? What about the churches open and the mosques don't? And, you know, there was a, there was another Muslim on the call and he said, you know, I'd be up for that. And I said, look, you know, I wouldn't be up for that. And the reason being is, is that that would create more issues than it would solve. It would automatically say that religions are of two categories. However, we don't mind supporting if you feel that fine, you need to open. But our advice to our congregation for the next three months is that no mosque will open. And for practical reasons, that we will not be able to maintain social distancing or physical distancing. You know, I can open a mosque for seven people, but what about the other hundred who are going to be standing outside? And within two months or so, the month of Muharram is coming. The month of Muharram is the most, in terms of congregation, you know, the, the holiest month where people do get together to commemorate the life and death of Imam Hussein. On average, I could have five or 600 people sitting there listening. There is no way possible that I can say seven people come in and everybody else stand outside. It's not practical. So in that situation, I'd rather say, we're not gonna open our mosques. And that will be, at least from a Shia perspective, and I can understand the anxiety within our Sunni brethren, as two very prominent Imams said, it's very difficult for us to do that. And I said, fine, you know, we cannot give a blanket statement therefore. Even if the government says on the 4th of July, places of worship should open, we still need to make a decision based on the safety of our own people. Because above and beyond, we're responsible for the lives of people in the eyes of God. And that's not something that I'm gonna take lightly. If one person contracts Corona, if one person dies, God forbid, that's something on my shoulders until the end of my life. And even beyond that. So I said, look, you know, fine. If you feel that you must open, for example, your church or your temple, you know, please make that decision and we'll support your decision, but we cannot open our centers at least for three months, if not more than that, because there is no way we can actually maintain physical distancing. And if the youth can, I can't see our elders above 70 being able to do that. They will hug and they will shake hands and they won't realize, and something may happen, somebody may sneeze, somebody could cough, and that's a real big anxiety. If somebody sneezes, 
it goes, as I was saying, the entire congregation can fill. And if you're on a balcony and you sneeze, and that's it, it's, it's game over. Now, saying that, yes, I know of our sister mosques or our brother mosques in Orlando, which have opened. And they're saying that, yes, we're going to observe two meters or three meters. Well, perhaps they can. They're a huge mosque. But we don't have that kind of a structure or building because we don't have land to build on. You know, they may have a huge property, but in the United States, you're allowed to build huge properties. And, you know, maybe the mosque is much larger than the congregation. Maybe there's a possibility. But we can't follow suit on that. And, you know, for me, even if it was a huge mosque, a mega mosque, even then, you cannot regulate people to physically distance. Mm. And if I'm responsible for a particular property, that would give me nightmares. That, you know, let's say somebody opens up a tap to wash their hands, another person comes and touches it and rubs their face, for argument's sake. You know, for us, that's an anxiety. And, and so therefore, not forgetting, by the way, the whole Islamophobia question as well. So for me, it's difficult, even if the UK government, and I've communicated this with the Scottish government, they said, look, even if you open up, that's your decision to make. And that's your informed decision. And that's after you've consulted everyone, because they are consulting, you know, hats off to the Scottish government. They're consulting all faiths on a regular basis, at least every Thursday, I know, if not more than that, are regularly in contact, but I've made it clear that as far as the Shia community is concerned, it is not viable for us to open until either the, the rates of infection go all the way down or there's some sort of antidote which is invented for this. Because even if one person dies, that's very difficult to digest. And our responsibility is to save lives, not endanger lives. Mm -hmm. Can I just, just add on to that? Just, just, just the other comment I would, I would want to make to worshippers is they love their places of worship. They're important to them. It's yes. where they feel, and many of them, it's where their families, and you know, you know I've got families who've been worshipping in the, in the same building since it was, it was opened 200 and odd years ago. And all the restrictions we're going to have to have to, to social distancing, etc. the experience of being in church will not be the same. It will not be the pleasant experience they've had. It will not be that sense of looking at the, 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 the same windows as their relatives did. It will be an unpleasant experience of separation and division. And there's part of me which says, if I could just get that communicated, saying, let's wait until we can actually, as you say, stand shoulder to shoulder, or, or in our case, <laughs> in, the, in the back four pews, then we should be fine. <laughs> It's getting that across to people. Of course. Thank you both so much for your insights, particularly about the personal decisions you've have to made, have had to make rather, and about the roles, the responsibilities that you assume, how you see those manifesting in different circumstances. It was an incredibly fruitful discussion. I thank you both for your contributions. I wish both your congregations the best of health and the best of safety during this time. And we hope that will be rejoined in times which are much easier, <laughs> much Thank more normal. You. Thank you both for your contributions. God bless both. God bless. God bless. Thank you so much. God bless you.